Reducing emissions from shipping by improving energy efficiency is an integral part of the global drive towards a more sustainable shipping industry. In the context of the global supply chain, large commodity traders are increasingly committed to reducing their scope 3 emissions, but may view ship emissions as marginal compared to other more challenging areas of operation, such as mining. The terms of commodity sales contracts are rarely aligned with their counterparts in cargo charter parties. This creates challenges in implementing operational measures to make shipping more energy efficient as part of the broader goal to achieve energy and process efficiency gains across the supply chain. Optimally, the global supply chain needs to operate as a continuous and uninterrupted pipeline moving goods seamlessly from origin to destination. From a cargo commodity perspective, delays at origin and destination are disproportionately more costly than delays to ships waiting in ports. This situation is compounded by the shipping industry's tendency to use standard charter party forms that must be amended to counter contractual principles that were created for a business model that was not designed to reward energy efficiency. A prime example is the long established principle of utmost dispatch which provides charters with commercial certainty in terms of the arrival of the chartered ship. This legally obliges the ship to proceed as fast as it safely can, even if a berthing delay is expected. While it's essential to maintain the commercial certainty that the principle provides, the consequence has been a sail fast then wait culture, primarily in bulk shipping, which inhibits a more widespread adoption of energy efficient operational measures such as just in time arrivals. While the shipping industry widely considers sail fast then wait to be a suboptimal practice in the context of reducing emissions and increasing efficiency, paradoxically, cargo owners focused on security of supply and maintaining the supply chain pipeline consider it an optimal practice. Shipping works on a derived demand basis, which means that it is controlled by external players. Shipping's business model changes in response to changes in business practice by those who use shipping's cargo transportation services, not the other way around. This requires broad collaboration and cooperation with multiple stakeholders to develop and deliver a holistic systemic change where shipping becomes a seamless component of the global supply chain pipeline. With a clear and recognized need to work more collaboratively and blend technological solutions with contractual provisions, we stand at the threshold of a new dimension in shipping that could benefit from an alternative business model. The Fourth Way project is a concept for a new business model with a holistic and incentivized approach that is focused on the supply chain pipeline. The key elements of the model will be decarbonization, digitalization, sustainability, collaboration and cooperation, all of which will be drawn together to form the basis of a fourth commercial contractual solution complementing existing voyage, time and bare boat charter parties. So what are then the elements that will make a potential new business model for the shipping industry where we move away from pure commercial imperative to taking account of drivers for efficiency in the industry? So let's start by having a look at the situation with charter parties at the moment, voice charter parties used in the dry bulk sector. Um, on the screen here, you can see an example of BIMCO voyage charter parties that have been developed over the past few decades, specifically aimed at uh, individual commodities, whether it's uh, cement or coal or iron ore or brain. Uh, and these are the sort of the numbers of documents that we've produced over the past 10 years. Uh, now, the numbers in the columns here, if you look at the pink one, says 83. That's not 83,000 or 83 million or whatever. It's just 83. 83 copies of a voyage charter party. So evidently not a great demand for special commodity-based voyage charter parties in the industry. So what is being used? 
Uh, well, let's have a look at BIMCO's Gen Con 1994, General Purpose Void Shot Party. You can see it by far and away outstrips the use of any of these cargo specific void shot parties. So, this is the big success. Obviously, this is what everyone is using. They're just taking the sort of plain vanilla void shot party and adapting it for different commodities. But if we drill down a little bit deeper and have a look at uh, the figures for Gen Con 1994 over the past 10 years, you can actually see that it's declining in use itself. Year on year, we're seeing less and less final executed copies of Gen Con 1994. So this is not to say that there are less voice charter parties being done in the industry. It's the way these contracts are being used uh, by the industry that is perhaps changing. And it's a similar story, uh, perhaps, if we look at the time charter sector as well. So dry bulk time chartering. Again, BIMCO forms here. We can see the bulk time, uh, just over 3,500, 3,800 copies in the past 10 years. Not a huge number at all. So again, these uh, specific forms may be not as popular as we imagine. And then we look at the industry's most popular dry cargo time chart party, the NYPE form, dwarfs all of the others. So it really is maintaining the top spot. But when we look at the NYPE, again, drilling down a little bit to look at a bit more details, what do we see? What is this reflecting in our industry? Well, nearly half of all of the NYP forms used by the industry in the dry bulk sector today are the 1946 version. That's a form that was written 77 years ago. Even the more progressive companies that moved on to the NYP in 1993, again, that's a 30-year-old form. But these two forms between them absolutely dominate the uh, time charter market. And the newest form, the 2015, only 6%. It's, it's a tiny percentage. So we're not really seeing people move on to the more modern forms. They're relying on older forms, which they are adapting. Uh, they're putting on additional clauses and rider clauses to make them work for current sort of business environment. So what does that mean for our industry? Well, essentially out there, we've got this old chip, the MB Time Charter Party, that contains contractual principles that were written often decades, perhaps even 100 years ago, that are still being used in our industry because they're embedded into these contracts. And therefore, to reflect changes in the way the industry is working, changes in the way that we need to move ahead to focus more on efficiency, means we need to rewrite or overwrite some of these existing principles, which can create uncertainty and conflicts within charter parties. So we're entering a difficult area, but it's something that BIMCO has been trying to tackle um, for a long time. Things like sanctions, we all have to deal with sanctions in business. It's a very, very important part that we have some proper contractual provisions in our charter parties. In these older forms, there's nothing. There's no mention of sanctions at all. So over time, BIMCO has developed a series of sanctions clauses that you can put into your charter party. So it's like a sticking plaster approach to patch up what's absent or not uh, sufficiently worded in charter parties. Uh, we've developed a standalone clause to, to add. Same thing with piracy. Uh, we saw the growth of piracy off the Somalian coast in 2010. Um, for the first time, we saw ships with their crew being taken away and held for ransom. This was nothing that was uh, dealt with within the existing time charter parties. We needed to deal with it contractually, so we developed uh, detailed clauses to deal with that. So again, sticking plaster over something that's not quite right in these standard forms. Infectious diseases, we've just had the COVID pandemic. Um, there was nothing really written in standard forms about how to deal with this scenario where trade ships were still able to sail in and out of the ports or whatever, but there was a restriction on the movement of crew. Uh, and of course, essentially every single port in the world was impacted. So it wasn't a case of saying, I'm not going to that port. You, you, you couldn't go anywhere if that was, that was your attitude. So we, again, we needed a code of uh, operation to put in our charter parties. And so we came up with infectious diseases clauses to deal with that. And then finally, perhaps the most important thing of all that we're having to deal with in the industry is fuel and emissions. And none of these rather dated forms uh, has much in the way of dealing with bunkers. I think the MIP 1946 even refers to bunkers being best Welsh coal. It's so outdated. Obviously, people strike that out. But nevertheless, we need more detailed provisions dealing with fuel and fuel types and quality of fuels and claims against fuels in our charter parties. And fundamentally, we need now to deal with emissions. How do we deal with emissions in our contracts, uh, CII for, or whatever? All of these things have to be dealt with in a charter party. 
So again, we've come up with a whole suite of clauses that overwrite the existing principles that we find in charter parties, allowing us things to do uh, like think like slow steaming, which otherwise you wouldn't be able to do unless you write a specific clause because you have this utmost dispatch obligation, virtual arrival and just-in-time arrival, uh, adjusting the speed of the vessel to arrive at a port at a specific time. Again, you need to amend the underlying principles of a charter party to be able to do this, and this is what these clauses provide. And then finally, CAI, how do we deal with that commercially when the owners and the charterers have to work together uh, to operate the vessel efficiently uh, and you know, reduce emissions and hopefully maintain a high CAI rating? So again, you need clauses for all of these things. And this is what we're doing to the existing older, older charter parties. It means this is getting bigger and bigger and more and more complicated and open to you know, uncertainty and perhaps uh, conflict as well. So maybe it's a time to look at a new form of uh, charter party, a new form of contract, maybe the, the charter party as we see it now, as we move into this uh, you know, more efficiency driven era, needs to be rethought slightly. We've come up with the, the fourth way here. So, you know, again, we can see the, the suite of charter parties and contracts we have at the moment, the voyage charter party, the time charter party, variable charter parties. And now looking at, is there another way that will complement uh, these existing charters or offer an alternative uh, to their use, something that's more reflective of our drive towards efficiency. The fourth way, charter, as we would call it, is not it's not as simple as just putting uh, writing a contract. I think it has all sorts of elements to it and it needs to have a much more sort of all embracing holistic approach to a business model for 21st century shipping where we're having to think about and, and deliver on different things than we have in previous decades. Uh, and it's got to be looking at the efficiency thing and it's got to be inclusive of shipping operations within the supply chain. So no longer looking at simply the relationship between the owner and the charterer. How does the shipping transportation service sit within this global supply chain pipeline? And how do we work with all the stakeholders to realize the best possible efficiencies? So how we pull this together is, uh, you know, the, 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 absolutely, we need technology. We need to apply technology in a contractual context as well. I think increasingly we will see the, see the marriage of these two things together. We will be putting sensors on board ships that uh, provide us about uh, valuable information about how that ship is performing. And it's going to be information that both parties need to agree to as a single truth. And that's all be what contractually binds them to say we accept that as how the vessel is performing. And so perhaps in the future, we can look at performance clauses that reward a ship owner if he overperforms, but reduces the higher rate if he underperforms. So these sort of things, mechanisms based on, on data and information and technology that we get from ships in the future. And of course, these th two things together, technology and, and contracts, is how we're going to help drive down emissions on the decarbonisation agenda. And pulling all of that together, um, ultimately, decarbonisation is one goal, but in the really, really long run, it's all about making shipping more efficient and, and make, you know, making sure it can keep efficient in the future as well. So the four key elements that we're looking at, decarbonisation, absolutely top of the agenda for the shipping industry, for all industries in general, um, working together with digitalisation, digitalisation and decarbonisation very much go hand in hand. You can't really separate the two things. We need digitalisation as an enabler to drive down emissions and to create a commercial framework for that, we need the contracts, contractualization, so bringing all these elements together, pulling them all together. But of course, for it all to work and for us to realize the, uh, the full uh, benefits of these systems, we need to work together. Collaboration uh, is a word much used in, in lots of sort of contexts and lots of conferences these days, but it essentially means all of the stakeholders need to collaborate and cooperate, work together to find solutions that will drive down emissions, and that's at the very heart of it. Um, for the shipping industry, uh, sure, we've always collaborated to a certain extent, but now I think this concept of commercial collaboration, where perhaps an owner and a charter really do need to decide and agree amongst themselves how can they can operate that ship most efficiently, um, and that's going to be a key thing in the future. So all of these four elements being pulled together to create this fourth way project. 
and ultimately in summary what we're looking at here is the focus needs to be on the global supply chain the whole thing end to end supply chain the pipeline that moves goods across this planet let's not forget the shipping is responsible for moving something like 80 percent of the world's goods so we play a very important role although we're seen as a, a marginal cost in all of this uh, we are seen as sort of being a reliable service that's out there to serve the needs of the global supply chain but we need to be a tightly integrated part of that to make sure that we can realize the full benefits of efficiency in the supply chain and to do that we need to look and work with all of the stakeholders involved we need alignment across the range of contracts that are used in the supply chain so we can realize these benefits and make sure there's a very coordinated approach uh, right from end to end and we're going to do this by combining technology and the contracts putting the, the the two things together so we can you know, use the data, use the information to make well-informed business decisions and also to create new win-win incentives for parties. Um, I think finally the big focus here has to be on creating new incentives. Uh, in some ways the incentives we have at the moment are in a world of efficiency is rewarding inefficiency. The sale fast then wait is rewarding an inefficiency. A demurred scheme that or it gives you compensation for a, a slow cargo operation. We need to think of other ways of incentivizing the industry uh, to become more efficient. So looking at utmost dispatch, you know, taking away the obligation to sail as fast as you safely can from um, origin to destination, that needs to be looked at. So it allows us to slow steam to use just-in-time arrival and other solutions. The demurrage thing as well, um, you know, that, that can be quite profitable for owners if they kept waiting for a period of time. We need to think as the shipping gets more efficient and we have less waiting time, what other financial incentives are going to be available to the owners and the charterers to make them want to work as efficiently as possible. And then finally, the speed and performance issue as well. I mean, that's something we can tackle immediately and in the short term, which is what we should do to drive down emissions now. Let's think about, um, you know, rewarding good performance. Uh, you get paid a certain rate for performing, but if you overperform, you should be rewarded for that. It shouldn't be just based on a, a sanction for underperformance, which encourages owners to perhaps describe their ship in, in terms that sort of create a buffer to prevent sort of claims and things. Let's get data that's acceptable to both parties, a single truth, and let's work towards making the shipping industry much more efficient through a new and more efficient um, contract method, a new, a new business model for the industry. Thank you very much indeed for listening.